The following is an emergency podcast episode about the war in Ukraine. All monetization of this episode will be going to Global Givings Ukraine Crisis Relief Fund. Please consider making a donation yourself. Link in the show notes. Adam Tews, professor at Columbia University, and Matt Klein, the author of the Overshoot Substack, recording Sunday afternoon around 5 p.m. Eastern. Where do we start? Oh, I mean, I don't know. I don't think I can remember a scarier moment. Um... And I'm like, you know, I'm a, I'm so old. I remember the 1980s. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me, I just had this horrifying realization last night, actually, after, after there was the joint transatlantic sanctions declaration that the next obvious step was exactly where we ended up heading this morning, Sunday morning, which was some sort of escalation into the nuclear space on the Russian side. Barring, I don't know, some absolutely massive artillery strike on Kiev or whatever to like decide the issue, but um, I don't know. That that for me is the the state of play, right? That we've maybe in all our talk about Iran-style sanctions on Russia, we've uh, we've missed the rather obvious point that the point of the Iran sanctions is to stop them getting nuclear weapons, whereas Russia actually, you know, seriously has them. I mean. Adam, you probably know this better than I do, but my understanding of the Cold War history is that Russia was very much committed to second strike nuclear capabilities and that it was the U.S. which had the deficit of conventional forces that was presumed to want to strike first, which, I mean, you're saying, I mean, obviously a lot's changed since then, but you're saying this would be a sort of fundamental shift in their security doctrine if that's really where they're going with it. Well, I don't know whether I actually mean this at that level of technical analysis. Um, because I take your point and a bunch of other people I think have been saying this online as well that like it's not obvious that first strike is actually anything they're equipped for it's just qualitatively a new step in the rhetoric and the you know imagining on the Russian side of what kind of a crisis we're in um, and you know you could have expected them to counter your European and American financial and economic sanctions by uh, cutting off oil and gas. And there's a bit of me that thinks the Europeans and the Americans want them to do that because it'll spare us the political cost of having to do it from our side. Because you know Biden said they're not going to do that. Right. So anyway, you see where I'm getting. And instead, they go into this qualitative new space. And you yeah. and you think it's what? it's it's not a zero. You yeah. mean just pure bluff? <laughs> I don't want to find out. <laughs> I don't, and I don't think we want to play the game of trying to find out either. To be honest, I mean, do we? I mean, surely not. <laughs> for this to be even on the table at all, for us to be talking about this issue is, I mean, um, I guess the question then becomes terrifying. You know, to the extent that it seems as if. The Russians, the Russian government and Russian society was not prepared to face any kind of resistance, even though, quite frankly, they should have. You know, the extent to which we think that there is sort of the sort of escalation of nuclear or what have you, I think would be predicated in part on the presumption that the government remains unified in its objectives, as a, which might not necessarily be an accurate reflection of how this plays out, because... I think to the extent anyone was expecting anything to happen, they expected it to go a lot more smoothly. And so if it's not, you know, I don't think, I mean, obviously there are a lot of potential outcomes here, but I mean, one, I think non-trivial possibility is that, you know, even if Putin might want to do something or other people close to him might want to do something, they might not be the ones in charge to make that kind of a decision if it were to lead to the kind of escalation that, you know, you're reasonably concerned about. Yeah, I mean, I really got freaked out when there was that, I think, spoof tweet that went round about Gerasimov having been moved to the side or, um, because exactly, I mean, if we see like substantial changes in the military command chain at a moment like this, after all the US has played through this scenario relatively recently, mm -hmm. um, that would be, that would be cause for acute alarm. I completely agree. I mean, there was that piece in the Washington Post today about personalism as a form of auto, you know, a form of authoritarian rule. And the more bureaucratic, the more multipolar within Putin's apparatus, the more checks and balances there are, the more, the more secure 
I certainly feel about the situation, the more this becomes a matter of his personal pride and dignity um, and the less checks there are on decisions driven by that kind of logic, the more I think alarming the situation becomes. And even if this isn't like total escalation to, you know, global nuclear war and a full on exchange with the United States, there are a whole bunch of scenarios short of that, which, which would be mm -hmm. absolutely terrible from a European point of view. It's already terrible. Oh, well, I, it, yeah. it, it, it goes without saying, yeah. like, yeah. Um, yeah. Should we talk through some of those? Mm. Well, I mean, um, I, yeah, but I mean, the, what is extraordinary also is the extent to which the boundaries, right, between NATO, the EU and Ukraine, which two weeks ago, everyone was clear about two things, right, that it wasn't part of the EU and it wasn't part of NATO, nor was it going to be ever for the foreseeable future. And that was our line in relation to Putin, like you're being completely unrealistic. It's not going to happen. Um have become blurry. Von der Leyen, I think, has declared today that she wants to see Ukraine as part of the EU. I mean, that is cheap talk, obviously, but it's it's unprecedented. Um, it's tantamount to a kind of verbal form of the 08 Bush line on Ukraine and Georgia, which I personally have always regarded as causally significant in this entire and then on crisis. And then on the, the NATO world. side, I mean, you know, you 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 yeah. we have fighter jets now apparently getting uh Getting yeah. getting transferred over. I think they're coming from. I think they're coming yeah. from Europe, though, aren't they? The fighter yeah. jets. It's Boel that's promised the fighter jets. Uh -huh. So, I mean, from the hip on the point of view of the history of the EU, this looks as though it's going to be a truly it, dramatic moment. I know, following what happened in twenty twenty, Putin deserves a Monet Prize, arguably, for uh, the stunt of integration and solidarity we're seeing. Unpre I mean, Christian Lindner laughing at the CDU for saying, you know, that it's going to increase the deficit when they're talking about more defense. You know, the head of the He's, FDP, notorious yeah. for being head of fiscal austerity, saying, yes, we're going to spend $100 billion a year on defense. It's an investment in our freedom. Yeah. Who are you to talk about the debt right now? I mean, that's... He's declared know. renewable energy to be freedom molecules or freedom energy. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unfortunate that, it came, it, it, that this was what it took to get there. But I mean, the yeah. level of, in, you know, this is... And on the other hand, on the other hand Harbeck, with all you know, with respect to both sides, a seriously, clearly, seriously entertained conversations about extending the life of the nuclear facilities, including with the senior mm -hmm. figures in RWE. So there's clearly give and take here on the part of the major coalition partners. I mean, the the really striking thing is the silence of the SPD, relatively speaking, compared to the the really major presence of both you know Baerbock, Harbeck, and Lindner as as protagonists in this in this drama. Is yeah. this what's going to save the world from climate change? I don't know. The, the other, the other option, I, I just, I haven't actually dug deep into it. I never, I'm not sure I entirely trust the source, but there's this intercept piece about the relationship between MBS and Putin and Saudi and Russia, right? You could also see the hardening of some sort of last ditch fossil du fuel redoubt, um, that would, would emerge. I think that's many people's kind of anxiety, you know, because there's a nice scenario about that where the, the, where we have, as it were, consensual cut, dab, cut back in fossil fuel demand globally driven by Eurasian decarbonization. And that leaves the Saudis by happy chance as the last supplier standing, um, which reduces the geopolitical pressure. But if this heads in this other direction, you could imagine, you could imagine sort of more toxic scenarios. But it's a little, right. that's a time horizon that's very different from the yeah. one that we're currently right. in. I guess the other interesting thought, thinking, you know, sort of the other side of things is that presumably, you know, to the extent that there is spare oil production capacity available in other places, most notably Iran, um, you know, I, I feel like this could lead to some interesting, uh, well, yeah, I, yeah, I would imagine is... that people are thinking, I would be really surprised if people in the EU and in the Biden administration are not thinking about this very explicitly, because that's like, what, a million and a half barrel, two million barrels that are well, currently are. not? I mean, they've been pushing those negotiations really hard for the last couple of weeks, right? I mean, right. I think that's uh, clearly the intention is to bring the two million bar barrels back in, right? To... Yeah. And that, yeah. that would have an impact. I mean, it's not a perfect analogy, certainly, but I mean, OPEC in the 80s. I think in part as response to what was going on with Afghanistan helped undermine the USSR's balance of payments by dramatically increasing oil production. They had other reasons for doing that too, but you know, that's certainly yeah, this is famous 86 sort of, decision, right? Right. By, that's uh, certainly helped. Imani. I mean, so I, yeah, there are a lot of there are angles here. I mean, it, none of that helps with Europe's particular predicament in terms of gas. Uh, but in terms mm. of crude oil, I mean, it's definitely going to be, I think 
Cutters crucial for gas, right? That's the absolutely. And, and the Biden administration clear, yeah. was Although it's having, not clear how much clear capacity they have, though. No, not yeah. now. It's that's a more long term thing, right? Because they, well, they are making we could do these, it too. Right. Yeah, I yeah, think theirs is yeah. always going to be cheaper, Matt. <laughs> no, I mean no cheaper. I'm just mean, but it's like, always uh, going to be nicer and cheaper than America's. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that I mean, yeah, I mean, but like if you, you look at like the the set of liquefaction facilities in the U.S. that are under that have been approved. Yeah but not built yet. I mean, if that all comes online, she knows if it will, but I mean, the U S would be able to export something like 440 billion cubic meters of gas in theory, if they're running at maximum yeah. a year, which is so much more than what anyone else exports. It's, it's, I mean, Europe imports about 150 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia right now via gas prompt pipeline. So if we were in the situation of exporting 440 billion, you could easily cover that and all the Asian demand and have leftover Obviously, a lot of other things that would have to play out to make that work. It's unfortunately, this is also something that would take years from now. It's not yeah. a, a short-term solution to yeah. the current crisis, but the yeah, I mean, has definitely... a huge expansion program of its own along very right. similar lines. Right? In Australia, yeah, I mean a lot yeah. of. And the Germans have now basically agreed to build the LNG terminals. Finally, they've never had before. Right? They're the <laughs> only major European country without LNG terminals, right. so that's turned out to be a bit of a mistake. Right. Um, well, Let's, let's take a step back and, and 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 turn to the European response because I think that's really, you know, out of you know how, how does this how does the response match your um uh, ma match your expectations um and you know what 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 do you think is 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 you know what 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 are the sort of psychic causes that are driving um that are driving it? I think for an American audience, first thing to say is like. There's a huge European response right now. Right? I mean, it's sort of staggering. If you go into the, if you leave Twitter and go into normal America, like I'm going to go to the gym later on today, and it will in the gym on the video screens there appear as just one story amongst a whole bunch of other stories. It will not really be salient. Um, you know, maybe somebody will be paying attention. And this is a New York Upper West Side gym, right? So anywhere else in the US, this is like bottom of the agenda. In Europe, it, you know, I mean, Berlin today saw, what, 700,000 people on the street, something like that. It's absolutely staggering. So it's really driving this. But I also, th I also think that the, the fact of the matter is that if the Russians had been able to carry out this invasion in the way that most of us expected yeah. them to be able to do it, namely just to roll the, the Ukrainian resistance in a matter of hours, and and push their way to Kiev and and you know just just wipe aside the resistance. I'm I'm pretty certain also that Europe would simply have shrugged. I don't yeah. actually think that we would be seeing what we're seeing right now. And it's uh, there's an incredible kind of contingency there that is. But now I think it's a huge dynamic. It's going to be very. Uh, hard to resist uh, for the from the point of view of politicians, many of whom were previously reluctant to do anything. Look. And so now, yeah, we appear to be in full scale escalation, expansion, integration. Look. You know, major, major. Let's moves. stay on that. I want to stay on that which contingency is, which is just surprising. for a little longer. I mean, is it the is it the moral <laughs> example of the Ukrainians fighting for themselves? Is it the possibility that this could not end? in a russian takeover what is it exactly that that um that that the resistance has 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 sparked across europe i mean you know you should, it may should chip in as well but like I, yeah. I think it's a it's a confused bundle isn't it of feelings um, i think it's all of that i mean you know yeah. i think the perception a lot of people had including a lot of people in the u.s was that you know the ukrainian government was just i mean i think it's the perception in many ways that putin probably had was the ukrainian government was just this you know very fragile facade that no one really cared about it, that the idea of Ukrainian nationalism wasn't a thing, and therefore that it would be easy to roll over them. And then we're seeing very clearly through a lot of violence that that's not true at all, that actually there is a Ukrainian state, that there is a sense of legitimacy of the Ukrainian government, that the Ukrainian people are willing to fight and organize in a very meaningful way, that the Russians are not being welcomed, that in fact there is you know a viability here of an independent state that is very committed at extreme cost of, you know, being part of Europe, not just being part of NATO as a military alliance, but being part of Europe. I mean, this is a point, Adam, you know, you made in Crash. I think like my, the, the most interesting part of the book for me um, was this whole section about like what drove the crisis in Ukraine mm. and how it was tied to the financial crisis and how it was ultimately, it wasn't about, you know, 
whatever Putin says and all of his apologists say like it's about NATO expansion. It's like, no, it's about the fact that they wanted to take a financial deal. And by they, I mean the people of Ukraine wanted to take a financial deal offered by the European Union and not one that was offered by Russia. Oh, no, that, we, can't, we can't say that for sure. They, they, were never, they never actually got to seriously contemplate the offer the Europeans originally made because it was so well, bad. Originally. Right. Yeah, the, but the, that was yeah, why. Was, okay. Yeah. Sure. We can so go, yeah. terrible. The Anikovich immediately that, said, "Oh my God! If I actually spell that out like that, I can't bring them that." You know, it was a terrible Christmas present. If they thought they were expecting, right. it, they never, they never got to see that because he pulled it back, took Putin's bait instead. That produced Euro Maidan, right. and then the offer they eventually did get was much, much better. Better. Right. I mean, allowing for the crisis and the drama right. and the loss of life, which is yeah. all very serious, but. You know, and in a sense, we're going through a yeah. similar escalatory spiral now right. where, in the fact, Euro the original offer from the EU is is is, is terrible. Right. Right. The Europeans um, got bailed out by Putin being aggressive, I think, is well, or you know, know, bailed out or like, you know, pushed into bailed making out, a pushed better into, deal. Yeah. yeah right. Pushed, pushed into, into making, into making a, better, a deal yeah. that was in the end. And, and, you know, if you believe the economic data and like I've gone back and forth on this and whether we can or not, and they just seem implausibly bad, but they're still absolutely terrible. Right. So. Despite those interventions since 15, we have not seen sustained rapid economic growth, no right. convergence with Poland. So there's, 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 you know, that, that weighs on this totally. And what's astonishing is now that apparently we're just going to leap over. Well, we don't know. I mean, this is just von der Leyen speaking to the cameras and what else she was, what, what else was she to say? Um, but, um, and it is a huge escalation as well. This is the other thing is, is I think, you know, this is the people at King's College London have this strong line, Sam Green in particular, you know, where they, where they say, you know, the thing that the Russia is really mainly worried about is, is EU accession rather than NATO, because it's much deeper, it's right. much more thoroughgoing. And, and if the EU takes that line now, then, um, you know, this becomes another huge red line in the right. negotiations, which one has to hope will happen. And, and I think the argument that, that the reason why it's so much a red line, which is compelling, is that Ukraine in many ways is a so post-Soviet state that's probably most similar to Russia. And if you see, if you are the <laughs> effectively dictator of Russia and you see that there, and your people, your, your subjects see an alternative mode of social organization and a transition from, you know, a corrupt authoritarian regime to one that is not, then that is going to be very threatening to you personally and your friends in a way that none of the other stuff, much more so than anything else that you might be concerned about. Uh, and I can see why that would be the kind of thing you'd be trying to crush, even if it's not something that sort of conventionally fits a win with, you know, Russia. Yeah, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure interests. I've ever really bought this kind of argument that Russia's main worry about the Ukraine is it will provide a kind of example of something different because, I mean, Russia is a very, I mean, Russia, Russia's GDP per capita, if you, believe all these numbers and like, you know, they're, 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 they're the devil's work in some way. But I mean, Russia is so much closer to Poland than it is to, to, to well, those Ukraine. Are averages. Is, they, those are indeed, but in anyway, I mean, the, the, um, uh, I think to, to a certain extent, Ukraine is the nightmare that Russia knows it escaped in the 1990s, right? The entire promise of the Putin project is that he built a state that dragged Russia out of the quagmire, which Ukraine has been stuck within. Um, so I believe that element of the story, and the, certainly on the part of liberal Russians and the liberal elite in Russia, the fear is that they're going to end up back closer to somewhere. Well, I mean, exactly what it would look like, it's not clear, right? Because in, in Ukraine, I do think, I mean, I think the wars had a hardening effect on the Ukrainian state. I'm not willing at this point to simply abandon the diagnosis that says it's a fragile entity. I think it is a fragile entity, um, but the impact of the war has been incredibly galvanizing. And it's sort of the perfect type of war for them, in a sense. It hasn't been an all-out shock and awe assault. This is not Iraq 2003. It's been, frankly, ill-judged, misguided, and something they're able to repulse. And so it rapidly constitutes a spiral of legitimization and consertion. And we are yet, unfortunately, I mean, the other routes to escalation, if the nuclear one does not strike many people as all that plausible, there is, in fact, I fear, a very serious possibility of a conventional escalation, which would have just terrible implications for Ukraine's big cities. We feared that last night, right? The talk was of mm -hmm. 500 tanks processing to Gord Kiv. They're not there yet. So maybe that too will turn out to be a paper tiger. That would really be staggering um, in its implications if the analysis is correct, uh, incorrect right. at that level, if, you know, Russia's 
conventional forces are a complete sham. It, it will be it will be really topsy turvy. Just following up on what you were saying before, Adam, about the significance of the European response, though, which I think is a huge story. And I mean, the fact that Sweden, which has made yeah. you know defined itself for so long internationally as being a neutral power, yeah. is sending you know Stinger missiles and anti tank weapons to Ukraine to fight Russians is remarkable. I mean, this is not the kind of thing that anyone would have thought would happen. I mean, it's right up there with, you know, the FTP spending, basically tripling the German defense budget. Uh, you know, this is, is really a sea change. I mean, I remember at the end of last year being relatively optimistic, I think a little more optimistic than you, Adam, about the prospects of sort of European fiscal expansion in this year. I was definitely not thinking about this, but I mean, the, the extent to which, you know, the various elections that occurred in European countries, some of which got more attention than others or whatever, I mean, it's really... Um, that and the interaction of events that we we're not anticipating is really remarkable what's happening there. And, you know, hopefully, you know, obviously everything else that's happening is really terrible, but that could be a positive consequence of this. And hopefully that can be this, this sort of sense of, you know, the possibilities and, you know, value of European solidarity. We'll see if yeah, I mean, persists, we shouldn't but... be, I mean, the risk here is that we are caught in a kind of 2015 euphoria, you know, like the euphoric German reaction to their initial response to the refugee crisis, which has some of the similar aspects. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Europe was massively divided in the in 2016. I mean, it's a bit like with fiscal austerity, right? It doesn't hit you in 2008, nine, it hits you in 2010. There is a there is a cycle of, as it were, euphoria followed by hangover. And, you know, I would fear that again in this case. I think I think the reaction to the Ukrainian refugees that we're seeing across Europe right now, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been talking to European friends today and like people are jumping in vans and driving to the border to help out and taking days off from work so as to show their solidarity. This is very much the vibe in Germany of 2015. Mm. But I think it's also a reaction to what everyone yeah. knows followed. And we've also been following the truly scandalous treatment of people of color on the border, right, by, by border guards on both sides. I gather the Nigerian foreign ministry has now been finally in touch with the Ukrainians to say, you know, get your act together. This is absolutely unacceptable. But, um, but yeah, that's the, these things play out. They have a dynamic. There is a euphoria. One shouldn't constantly, you know, <laughs> one, should, one should relish the, the high when one's having the high and not constantly live under the shadow of what may come next. But, um, yeah, this is, uh, it's truly, truly, um, remarkable and, and very difficult to calculate with, right. As a matter of policy, I mean, it's, 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 I do think everyone's assumptions were premised on this idea that this was going to be short, sharp, overwhelming, conventional military risk victory for the Russians. And that left everything in place, essentially. Because Ukraine had been written off. I mean, America's could hardly have been more straightforward about it. No blood will be shared, minimum commitment. It's up to Putin to see whether he wants to risk doing this. And all of a sudden, we're now, A, the Russians are bogged down. It's a humiliation so far for Putin. And we are raising the stakes now from the Western side. And we should be very clear about the fact that we're doing that. And what my overwhelming worry now is, is you know, in the same way as the battlefield has added this huge element of just unpredictable, you know, um, very, you know, just unpredictable events to the, to our thinking, what will the massive announcement of sanctions do to the Russian economy tomorrow? And we'll begin to find out literally in the next couple of hours, because the ruble market will open, you know, on Sunday evening, East Coast time. And we'll begin to see quite how large this is going to be. But it's, that's my, that's my kind of my next big worry, I would think. Yeah. And, you know, we can say, well, that was the idea. That was the plan, you know, to inflict damage. But are right. we under the shadow of this shift to the nuclear dimension really ready for the fallout? I don't know. I don't think it was probably part of the calculation. I think they were driven by the demand to do something on SWIFT because the European public was demanding it and the Germans and the Italians felt humiliated by the reaction to their um, to their conservatism on that. Um, talking about sort of the euphoria and the um, and the and the sort of comeuppance that's that's going to take place over the next uh, uh, weeks and months. Um, Matt, do you want to uh, give our our uh, NATO sanctions uh, a spin? 
Oh yeah. Well, here's a little preview, right? I mean, you know, the the way sanctions work at the end of the day is that you're preventing transactions that would have occurred otherwise. The normal sort of boring econ 101, which I think is basically right, is that those transactions are good for both sides. So if you're preventing those transactions, you're obviously hurting the side you're targeting, but you have to be willing to hurt yourself. It doesn't work otherwise. I mean, I think that's one way of looking at it is it's like a hunger strike. And hunger strikes can be very effective, but you have to be willing to, you know, go hungry. And, you know, the question then becomes, if you're going to do this to Russia, I mean, obviously Russia is a significant economic and financial exposure to Europe. The fact that the Europeans were initially hesitant to do these kinds of sanctions makes perfect sense because there would be a real cost to them. The fact they're willing to do it now is encouraging in terms of their sense of solidarity, but it is going to be potentially difficult to sustain to the extent that it's going to be hitting a lot of their exports. It's not just the Italian luxury handbag makers and the German car makers and, you know, everyone else who's, who's been, you know, initially cautious about or the, or the Austrian bankers. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be, you know, significant, even if the gas kept flowing. And so the, the thing that, you know, Jordan and I have been talking about is that and it's ironic because originally this kind of concept was something that we came up that I, I sort of came up with as a joke, but I think it's serious in terms of, you know, the response to what, what China did to Australia, you know, over a year ago is there has to be some way for the democracies to compensate each other to, you know, ensure the solidarity. And that, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate that basically it might seem strange if you're, you know, bailing out Italian handbag makers that were counting on sales to oligarchs. But if you want to maintain a united front, for the sake of something bigger, then that is a price you have to pay because the alternative is that they undermine sanctions and then you don't get what you want. And so, you know, how you go about that specifically is, you know, a technical question that, you know, there are plenty of people who are capable of finagling those rules can come up with. But that's, I think, what we have to be thinking about. If, you know, unless this ends quickly, you know, that, you know, if you want to maintain the durability of this coalition and avoid, you know, as you were saying, like, there's the initial euphoria and then there's the hangover. If you want to avoid that, because there is that economic shock in Russia is going to redound back to Europe and quite frankly, through Europe, the U S one way or another, there has to be some kind of plan in place to offset mm -hmm. that. And I think it can be offset with the exception of gas. That's a tricky one, but like, cause that's a physical constraint, but everything else I think can be offset and we should be you know thinking about how to do that in order to make this work. I mean, it's an absolutely basic concept. It's a really fundamental concept. Um, this. I mean, as a historian, I'm immediately triggered because because uh, West Germany, after World War II, operated an enormous process of internal compensation for its own citizens for bomb damage and for um, for the people who the 13 million Germans that were driven out of Eastern Europe um, after the war, and it was called the Lastenausgleich, so burden sharing, bird balancing. And the model for it was, in fact, legislation legislation passed in the Third Reich under under the Nazis. So their socially solidaristic national socialist conception of war fighting included an element of this precise this this logic. Because right? it's not obvious to me that it's democracies should have it, if you like, but it's certainly not necessarily a me me mechanism restricted to the democracies. And I would expect Russia to adopt something rather similar on their side. In fact, they have track record of doing this at times. Um, with regard to Europe, I understand the German ministries are preparing plans to effectively nationalize the gas market. So to take the whole thing under state control, to regulate prices and to impose, it'll be rationing. They'll call it, you know, load shedding or something like that, but it'll effectively be rationing. They'll target it at industrial consumers. Emerging markets do this all the time. China and India did it throughout last year to handle their energy crisis. You don't, you cut off domestic consumers as an absolutely last resort and just switch corporate users of electricity or gas on and off to and and they can adjust you have to furlough some people and we know what to do with that now in europe as well you just put workers on short time like you did during covid it's no big drama if you've got a decent labor market administration none of this i think will work in the united states i mean it's very hard to imagine any of it working in the united states i mean america can't even do a strategic trade policy so i mean you know i mean the its hands are effectively bound with regard to to, but maybe it's possible. Maybe, maybe you know, the maybe the 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 devil of Putinism would allow Congress to pass some legislation that would 
what what would it be? It would often well, I mean, compensate I, I like, households for higher gas prices or something. Well, I mean, it depends on what you think the compensation. I, again, I don't think the energy is the way to look at it. I think it's more like the lost exports of oh, okay. what you were going to sell to them. Um, I mean, the energy side, I think, is like a whole different can of worms that I agree requires the kind of stuff you're talking about. But I think the more basic level is you have a bunch of European companies and European banks that are used to making money from Russia, and now they're not. No one's going to buy mm-hmm. their stuff. Those loans are all going to get written down. That's a lot of losses. I mean, the good news is we have very good practice very recently of how to deal with that, which is just give mm-hmm. a lot of money. And I think actually the U.S. would be fine at this. I mean, I don't think the U.S. exposure is that high, but like, no, it's tiny. you know, PPP. I mean, I remember at the beginning of COVID, it was, it was uh, Emmanuel uh, Sayers and Gabe Zuckman came out with a little, very short little like five-page paper about, you know, you just offer to have the government be the buyer of last resort. Planes aren't flying the way they were. You just make up the sales. That was a good model for COVID. It's not quite mm-hmm. what any government actually did. But, you know, it's just as good a model mm-hmm. here, I think, um, mm-hmm. for this kind of thing. I mean, again, the energy market's a whole separate challenge, and it probably will require what you're talking about. But, I mean, the good, for better or worse, the U.S. is much less exposed to that relatively than Europe. But, I mean, the, the thing that I'm more potentially concerned about is, like, German and Italian governments had reason for not wanting to drop the hammer down on Russia for financial sanctions. And that reason, aside from the energy issue, was their own businesses. And so mm-hmm. if you can compensate those businesses, that essentially, you know, obviates that concern. And I mean, the good news is for all our other issues, like between Europe and the U.S., we can create as many euros and dollars as we want. So if you lose one there, you know, you can make it up somewhere. I mean, they're you're mm-hmm. calibrating that in the right way is, you know, an issue. But I mean, compared to what the alternatives are, this seems like something we have to be thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree. I mean, I think, though, certainly... The politic, the you know, the political argument, the frame of the political argument has changed so dramatically in the last month. And we, I mean, Nord Stream was the canary in the coal mine, right? Because Nord Stream is a German corporate project or European. It's not really even exclusively German by any means. It's a European corporate project par excellence. And um, it was always defended precisely on those terms, right? I mean, they're not shareholders now, but that's a technicality. It's a way of avoiding sanctions. They're all just in, in the form of loans. And um, that's dead, I think, at least for the foreseeable future. It's very difficult to imagine it coming back. And I didn't say, I mean, I'm mean, on the record as recently as last week saying I didn't think it was dead. And like, well, I've changed I just, the last week. So Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I didn't feel too bad about the call. It's just like, no, I didn't anticipate this. Um, but I think that changes the parameters. And then, as it were, the, com- the conversation shifts to compensation, essentially. Yeah, it shifts to one or other type of, of insurance sort of mechanism, some sort of guarantee fund. Yeah, then one would have to be imaginative about it. But Russia is, you're right, Matt, to stress it's significant it, for Europe. It's its trivial for the United States. Of course, your original proposal was the was the Australian wine fund, wasn't it? Which was right. Which is China, and China's not trivial for anyone. I mean, so no. the scale of the liabilities there in such a program would be be much bigger. Um, I don't think they're unmanageable if you really want to go down this route to buy yourself some some flexibility and also credibility versus the Chinese because the Chinese and the Russians have long speculated right. on our cupidity and our unwillingness to like you know impose tough tough measures so yeah. we could remove that from the table as well we've got this crazy fund um let's take that and and broaden it out a little bit how much do you do you two think this is going to have um both the EU and US uh reimagine their uh, relationship with China going forward I was going to write this piece for tomorrow morning, which was going to be called Neither, Te- Neither Tehran Nor Beijing. Um, because I think there's a, you know, we're, we're um, they're very different. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're really different. I mean, because we used to say things like, you know, the new Cold War with China is different because we're deeply entangled with them economically. And here we are having some sort of terrifying replay of the old Cold War with a country we are deeply entangled with, which unlike China, even if it doesn't prioritize first strike capacity, nevertheless has a highly capable, serious nuclear arsenal, which China really doesn't have. And here we are, right? And and let's not get confused about what paradigm we're dealing with here, because I do think China is radically different again. And... um, It'd be interesting. It depends a lot on how the Chinese themselves choose to play it, right? And um, we're we're only just at the very beginning of seeing yeah. how that plays out. Jordan, I have to ask you. I mean, what do you? How yeah, hard okay, do you think the, the Chinese ch- are viewing this? Because I I feel like I've read news articles about how they're not pleased with how things have been going, and 
but you know, I'd love to get your sense. I mean, you watch the stuff. Yeah, more I mean, what's the what's the Dungeons and Dragons? I don't think I don't think she is in the chaos line of that sort of like three by three box. So I'm not. I don't think he's a. F- what are the other two lines? It's of like the three by three. What box? is it? I gotta look it up now. Neutral chaos. and lawful. Yeah, neutral and lawful. I think he's like kind of lawful. Chaos. I think neutral he's like and lawful. lawful evil. Yeah. Um, right. And that's supposed to lawful, lawful, lawful that's supposed evil. to chaotic evil, which is Putin, I guess. Yes. Would be the, Putin's yeah. chaotic evil. I think she is lawful evil. And so this sort of insanity, um, and you know, uh, you know, the, the, I think the speed is too fast for him. And I don't think he's the type of leader that, um, is kind of excited to see these sorts of dramatic shifts on the global stage. And, um, you know, my like very hot take on Taiwan is I actually think this helps Taiwan in that people are going to take Taiwan a lot more seriously than um, than they may have before. And the sort of lesson of not taking Ukraine seriously and all of a sudden we have to send them helmets um, because they don't have enough helmets um, to say nothing of, you know, your stinger missiles and your in your in your, you know, in your fire jets or what have you. Is gonna uh, is gonna make it a whole lot easier for Taiwan to um uh, to uh, uh, to to make the case that they need just as much support as their um uh, uh, as they've been asking. Shinzo for. Abe explicitly called for that. Ex- exactly, and you know the, I mean, the other thing is like right? the, I mean, he, he said we have to explicitly you know defend Taiwan. I was like, okay, that's that's a, that would be a change. And yeah, I mean but, the, the fact that Japan is on board with all of this is a really interesting one because I uh, you know I'm no I am no expert in in russia japan relations but you know over the course of uh over the course of putin's reign there have been some relative high points in that relationship and to, and to see them come out so dramatically um uh and and, and basically be in lockstep with the um uh, with the west on this i think is a real reflection of the fact that uh mm-hmm. that folks around the world and capitals around the world are seeing these issues as connected and if and if the west hadn't you know it if we had the contingency that you were alluding to earlier, Adam, of, you know, this ending in 48 hours and the U.S. and, and EU kind of shrugging, um, then uh, I would be a lot, uh, a lot more concerned that the sort of, uh, the sort of uh, deterrence that folks are hoping uh, is, is, um, is real enough in Beijing's minds to, dis- in, in, you know, Beijing policymakers' minds to deter them from doing anything in Taiwan would be, would be dramatically eroded. Hmm. Because my prior was always that, that, that no one would ever confuse you. So if you started with the previous model, in other words, Ukraine was a terribly weak state that could be rolled yeah. quickly, right? Then, of course, it never made any sense to analogize between Taiwan and Ukraine. Because Taiwan's clearly not that. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's, it's highly capable. It's a high income country. It has incredible technological capacity. Like, it's a huge state. Very... If they choose to blow up those chip fabs, right. everyone dies. Like... It's like a very close relationship with the U.S. military. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Explicit American security commitments, like the whole works. Like, so it never made any sense to me to analogize between Ukraine and Taiwan. So on that basis, I was always confident in saying China is too smart to learn any lessons from Ukraine. Ukraine is sui generis. So is Taiwan. So I'm not at all reassured by suddenly a shooting war in Ukraine with nuclear escalation and all the works with a very uncertain outcome, which I'm pretty confident is still going to be grim, suddenly being used as an analogy for, for Taiwan. I understand why that's happening, but yeah. I was much, I felt better in a world in which they were hygienically separate, not because I don't take deterrence in Taiwan seriously, but because I just didn't think Ukraine was a useful analog. If it does become that, it seems to me to add, it may indeed harden, you know, the understanding of deterrence, or it may sort of just dramatize and romanticize. I mean, that's the problem that what that's what worries me about what I'm seeing in Europe right now is the romanticism. And not because I reject that per se, or it's because it isn't praiseworthy, or I don't get it. I mean, it's hard not to thrill what's to going on. It's, it's unbelievable what they're doing, right? But but are, are we are we are we in? Does it really change our mind about what we expect the likely outcome of this to be? Um, except in a negative direction, frankly. That's my. That's, anyway, but this, just to come back to it, no, you see what I mean. Stay, let's stay there on a second. I'm, I, I want to. I want to explore that point because I don't quite understand it. So the romanticism is 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 overestimating the Ukrainian forces' chances. 
Well, first of all, it's thrilling to these acts of what may turn out to be suicidal resistance. And vicariously, from a position of great safety, engaging in a kind of romantic celebration of them. And I know that's what the Ukrainians are calling for. They, 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 in their moment of resistance, want this solidarity, appreciate this show of solidarity. But the question that we truly have to ask ourselves is, what is the final outcome going to be? Do we think it materially changes the odds to a point where it becomes reasonable to back those odds? And coming from the point that I was at five, you know, a week ago, that seems really unlikely. It is possible that all my priors were completely wrong and the Russians are a paper tiger and the Ukrainians are completely different from what I imagined. But I fear that they're not that wrong. And I fear that what will, you know, what will ultimately, as it were, push the game back into the Russians' camp is just absolutely overwhelming application of heavy artillery. And that's a terrifying prospect that we just haven't, you know, we're not there yet. We're just early days. Going back to the China thing, I'm curious what you all think of the fact that they, that China at the Security Council did not vote against the resolution and that this that's also... The Americans modified been... it, right? They asked the Americans well, modified still, them to I mean, ask it to express, you know, dismay rather than to declare it illegal or something. And so then they voted. Sure. But I mean, I mean, yes, that is, that is what they said. I'm just, but that still doesn't mean, I mean, given the dramatic expressions of friendship and the new, you know, Sino-Russian yeah. alliance, you know, a week ago, um, or as of last week, rather, I mean, it's striking. And then there, I think there's some reports about how Chinese banks have been sort of cutting back on some commodity exposures to Russia. I mean, I don't know how much of a deal it is, right? But it's, I mean, I, I you know, for as long as we're in the sort of hot takes thing, I wonder to what point Xi Jinping starts to view Russia as like another North Korea, as opposed to what they probably thought they were getting when yeah. they made this, you know, arrangement. Yeah. Um, I think like that's a really thorn in the side. Yeah, that's I mean, useful, that's but... surely everyone's question. Like, I think that's a really nice way of formulating it. If they're not, if it's if it's if they're not Iran, are they North Korea? Um, is a is a is a is a nice way of formulating this. I was really struck by that report. It was just like a couple of lines in an FT report where apparently FT journalists had been contacted by their contacts in the Chinese foreign ministry and they'd been seriously and sincerely asking whether or not this was actually all just fake news from the West. So there is also an information bubble aspect to this, which is, which is non-trivial. I never know how much to read into this, but the accounts one gets of the inner circles of decision-making in Beijing suggest that as may be the case for large segments of Russian opinion, there is just, I mean, you know, I hesitate to invoke reality in a situation as polarized and partisan as this, but in some senses, there is a gap between their perception of the world and reality on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so for them, for senior, very well-placed Chinese to actually be so insecure in their judgment of the situation that they were asking Western journalist contacts for, for reassurance is, you know, yeah. really is quite, is quite, um, it's quite, it's, it's really telling, I think. Um, surprising. Well, for more on that, please go back and listen to the two-parter we did with Peter Martin about the nature of the foreign ministry. Uh, but I do think it is. Um, uh, I do think it's an important. It, it, it's an important point. I mean, no one on the state council has spent much time abroad. Um, I guess they have like kids who are studying in the West, but like that doesn't really count. Um, and I, I, I do think sort of what. Uh, uh, what, what Matt alluded to is is I think there is a part of China that is wor is worried about betting on the wrong horse and 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 hitching their ride to a uh, to a sinking ship as I'm mixing four metaphors at the same time. Um, it's uh, it, it. Okay, I had like two more metaphors coming. Oh, come head. on, Sorry. give us, give us. Let's have the whole lot. It's yeah. definitely the, the, time, Tom, the Tom Friedman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's uh. The the I think you're really going to see it um, in the in the coming weeks and months. Right. Because China is the only lifeline um, to Russia uh, for a lot of these sort of imports, which have been um, uh, which they've been uh, which which the which, you know, which are about to be um, uh, squeezed pretty dramatically and have a really dramatic impact on uh, on on sort of Russian industry and uh, and ordinary Russians well-being and the extent to which. Uh, Chinese uh, financial firms 
and uh, companies are going to be willing to risk uh, pretty dramatic secondary sanctions um, to to prop up like a not particularly important market for any of these uh, firms, I imagine is going to be the real uh, is going to be the real bellwether to watch probably more than the than the foreign ministry statements on a day. Have we basis. seen threats of secondary sanctions yet? in that form? Because, well, it, the details of the sanctions are just appallingly unclear, it seems to me. That, and I think that's part of the tactic is just strategic to, ambiguity. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. throw over the over, Overton window and say, guys, it's going to be bad, whatever you do. But yeah. I don't think we've heard anything yet, which suggests that I'm reminded that um, there's there's a kind yeah. of an immediate threat of secondary sanctions, is it? No, but they might be preempting the concern about it. I mean, I remember hearing a joke before the Europeans agreed to the sanctioning of the Bank of Russia. There was a joke that the, the New York State Department of Financial Services by itself could simply just ask for a lot of extra compliance guidance. And simply by doing that would basically gum up the entire global financial system's access to Russia without any formal declaration of sanctions. So, you know, I think that's probably something like that might be, you know, going through people's minds. You know, you just don't want to have to deal with it even if there aren't any official. I mean, if they go there, presumably sanctions. they just create a dirty bad bank that will do all these things, take the hit, be beyond, you know, just be, as it were, sacrificed to American sanctions and then move on with the rest of their trade. I mean, that's how I interpreted those, that report about Chinese banks pulling back is they don't want to be the one that's sacrificed. I mean, they want to be the one that stays mm -hmm. reputable in the West. And so somebody else can take over the business of financing this dirty Russian oil. At some point, Beijing will make the decision one way or the other. It's just all moving so fast right now, and the parameters are so unclear that it's not surprising to me that India, as China's keeping quiet. I, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by the Indian geopolitical dimension here because the other people to abstain, well, the other people to abstain were the UAE, which UAE. was which was quite something. I mean, right. whoa, like because they used to be touted in the Trump era as America's cat's paw right. in the Gulf and. You know, the war criminals of Yemen, and they were like the people to play with. And then, you know, whatever, the, the Trojans of the Gulf or something. No, 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 no. The Spartans of the Gulf was like the tagline for the UAE, right? And then um, <laughs> India. Yeah, India abstains. Um, despite featuring only just the other week in America's new Indo-Pacific strategy as, uh, you know, America's horse that they have hitched America to. Yeah. The rise of India is now something America officially backs apparently heedless of the impact on everyone else in the region but the rise of india is a good thing we're cheering that we're celebrating it and nevertheless they what? um unless they abstain but i mean they're so closely the argument apparently is they're so closely associated with russia historically their entire military kit is comes from russia right. they can't just simply pull away and they're really worried about the possible encirclement that you know a china russia pakistan china. kind of envelope puts around them and who was in moscow on the day the offensive began but imran khan right so okay. paying his respects well yeah i mean good luck good luck getting any uh any new spare parts from uh, the russian federation anytime soon if well, you're right for anything sitting, yeah. regardless <laughs> regardless they're not going to be right i mean that's... exactly they, they don't seem to be an abundant supply even for their own equipment um, right but I think that's a very interesting dynamic, right? The way in which this immediately spills over the new old Cold War with Russia immediately intersects with the new Cold War with China. The, yeah, the, the old, old war. Yeah. The old, old, yeah, yeah exactly. Right. I mean, it's, I, it's an incredible kind of right, intersection. Right. Yes. If, if U.S. relations with Iran and China improve at the same time they deteriorate with Russia and India, that would be a real throwback to, you know, pre-1971 you know, or whatever. But, uh, um, hmm. yeah, whereas the more likely configuration yeah, looked like... Or pre-1979, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Biden foreign policy. Uh, so we've got, we got, we got uh, I guess, TTC on the rise. Uh, Japan two plus two looking okay. Quad, some questions. Um, if you're thinking about sort of what what do you what what are your guys' takes on like to what extent pivot to Asia um, becomes uh, threatened or emboldened by uh, by all of this? Uh, my line forty eight hours ago was like realpolitik ruled. In fact, I did an entire podcast with Ezra, Ezra Klein on Friday, which we're going to have to completely re-record on Monday, which was under the premise of 
you know, yay, Biden realpolitik rules in the sense they've been incredibly hard line on Afghanistan. They've been incredibly hard line on Ukraine, no distractions, no commitments. If Russia wants this mess, it can have this mess was the kind of line it seemed to me that they were taking. And I don't know whether they're going to be able to sustain that position now. Um, the solution, you know, this, this isn't zero sum. It, you know, it's a pretty yeah. weird calculus to say this needs to be zero sum. If there's one thing that Congress will agree to, it's another hundred billion for defense. Like, you know, that isn't going to be a problem on the American side. Um, so if you needed to do both, you could probably, you could certainly do it. And in some senses, it would confirm the underlying suspicion that Russia and China were a package anyway. And so you had to address them. And that was always there in the strategic documents from 2017 onwards. You know, you had a you had a big Satan and a little Satan and, you know, um, the balance between them has shifted. So I think you could probably integrate. And I'm sure the message from the Biden people is to the Europeans, we told you so. You folks needed to get real. You needed to get serious. And if you don't learn the lesson now, there's really no helping you. If there's anything we can help with, you, you know, we'll do our best. But otherwise, you folks need to step up now. Um, and that seems to be the message that the Europeans are actually running with. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree completely. It's not a zero sum. I mean, in some ways, the fact that the Europeans have responded the way they have actually shows how positive summit could be because essentially the U.S. doesn't need to actually, I mean, yep. the U.S. has not committed anything military, like in terms of actual military force to Europe at all as a consequence of this, and it hasn't needed to, In fact, but the Europeans are independently. At the same time, we're also seeing, you know, rightly or wrongly, because of some of the perceptions that the Russian attack on Ukraine could be analogized to a Chinese attack on Taiwan, like the relation, you know, what Japan has been saying, and like there's clearly a dynamic there. Um, so I don't see that, I mean, it seems like it's all if anything, what we've seen is that there's a real latent capacity of the you know, democracies, broadly speaking, to actually project a lot more power than probably people had thought um, if they simply choose to do so, which is, I think, you know, broadly consistent. This story with, could tilt, you know, still tip, though, Matt. I mean, you know, come the end of this, sure. come the end of this week, we could be looking at a couple of ruined Ukrainian cities, the Russians triumphant, and everyone asking the question, why the hell was it only stingers and belated offers of Eurofighters? In the end, sure. this story could still end the way it looked as though it was going to end, but in a sense, with more broken hearts, more crushed romanticism in the meantime. And on the Europe's absolutely. defense, I mean, you know, the bitter truth is they don't need to spend a single euro more. They already outspend Russia by a handsome margin, even with purchasing power parity adjustment to the Russian spending figures. They just spend it in such a, I mean, historically abusively wasteful way that they get practically nothing for it in terms of, you know, the fact of the matter is that the commander in chief of the German army went on LinkedIn of all media to make a historic declaration that at a moment of crisis, he is one of Germany's leading soldiers, was empty-handed, quote-unquote. So sure, they've scrabbled together a couple of anti-tank missiles, and they're going to ship them out there, and that's a big deal historically, no denying it. But the, res the, the fact of the matter is, is they're pathetically underpowered at this moment and can deliver virtually nothing. And this wasn't true of Germany as recently as the late 1980s. It had the third or fourth most capable military in the world, was spending about 3% of GDP on defense, could mobilize about 450,000 troops peacetime strength over a million wartime strength so europe really doesn't really barely needs to break a sweat but it does actually need to overcome some serious political obstacles to concerting what it already does and if right. you if they if no, they so spend a bit more so, too well then great but it's all really about sure. the politics not, not to, yeah not not to dis i wasn't trying to dispute yeah. that my, my point more is that i think the the willingness to shift on that i think I mean, who knows, maybe this will go away, but it seems as if there is a dramatic shift in political willingness to change those yeah. things. And that would represent a significant change. And that would be, I think, revealing in terms, and again, like how much that's like a Biden foreign policy thing versus, I don't think, I mean, quite frankly, that's not, I think that's like yeah. something that they've come to, but I think that's significant. Come on, come on. That, Let's know, say it loud. I mean, like maybe it was Trump. <laughs> I mean... Like, you know, at least you've <laughs> yeah, got the it, question in an impolite way and forced the issue. Yeah, and, for sure. You know, and Obama tried between nice, that and Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Obama tried nicely. No one listened. Trump put it in a much more aggressive way. The Europeans were talking about strategic yeah. autonomy before this happened. Now is the time for the yeah. Americans to cooperate with the Europeans in making that a reality. I mean, like, it's... Right.
closing thoughts? I mean, I'm still going to say that, you know, even though it's not something I, I know enough about, but I think China is going to be a really, really interesting wild card here in terms of how they choose to respond. Their ability to help Russia in this time is not unlimited by any means, but it is substantial if they choose not to, or in fact decide that this kind of very blatant violation of everything they say they care about in terms of, you know, respecting national sovereignty and so forth and borders, they decide to actually, you know, stick with that or even simply just not help. I think that would be significant. I mean, how, you know, I will completely agree with Adam's point consistently. I mean, I said this before the, you know, actual invasion started, which is that, you know, financial sanctions are fascinating. Like I can write about financial sanctions. I can read about this stuff. But at the end of the day, like what happens on the battlefield is what's going to make the difference. I, you know, I don't know enough about what, I mean, it's, it's been striking the extent to which it has, you know, sustained this, this far. I don't know. I have no idea how it's going to play out. It could go a lot of different ways. I think we should certainly be prepared for the possibility that it will go become much more violent and much more destructive than it already has, even though, I mean, it already has been very violent and destructive. It could be a lot worse. But, I mean, the, you know, the potential positive outcome here is that if the Russian army is not interested in doing that, because this is not, I think, what most of them signed up for, then, you know, it could go a different way. I don't, I honestly don't know how that's going to play out. There are a lot of different, you know, it's certainly, I mean, I think at the end of the day, Putin took a tremendous risk the upside, there was some upside for him, but the downside, I think, you know, whether he knew what it was or didn't care, I mean, we're seeing that play out now and it's a very uh, disturbing time we're in, but I mean, I guess we've seen some encouraging developments in response, but you know, it could be, it could certainly get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah. I think the more you bring it back to the Ukraine itself and the problem of the Ukraine and its relationships with Russia, the more the mood shifts from sort of euphoria about what this may mean from Europe for Europe to just the really tough reality that it's very difficult. It was very difficult before this happened to see how a compromise was possible. And now it's vastly harder to imagine what kind of compromise is yeah. possible here. And we, of course, um, warm ourselves with the prospect of, of a Ukrainian victory, ultimately, I think, at this point. This seems to be the idea, right, that somehow through this heroic defense, they will stop the Russian offensive, the Russians will abandon the offensive, and on that basis, some kind of peace can be made. But that's a defeat, an utter crushing, humiliating defeat for the for Kremlin and Putin. And I just don't see how he could accept that. They didn't accept it in 2013, 2014, which is why they seized Crimea and then broke away the eastern Ukraine. And it's very difficult for me to see how they could possibly accept it this time. So if you put those two things together, the lack of a possibility of a compromise and the impossibility for Russia of accepting defeat, it's a, it's a recipe for, you know, for some very... The impossibility of Putin accepting defeat. Well... Yeah. I mean, my. But then those are some very my, grim scenarios and some very high risk scenarios indeed, right? right? Yeah, I right. think the I think the base case now almost has to be like a Groz Grozny, and just cities flattened. Um, Which is just unthinkable, because it's, right? it's 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 he he doesn't have a lot of other cards to play at this point, mm. and um, and 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 things domestically in Russia are going to turn a lot. <laughs> are going to turn a lot worse very quickly and uh without being able to sort of social progress but then but even then it's like you know chechnya these like are these like scary ethnic minorities right and and sort of doing the same thing to your brethren who are also neo-nazis i mean it's it's a it's a much harder sell i, I just think. at this point maybe Kansas we should just say about the ukrainians people. that they're very tough nuts to crack <laughs> I mean, incredibly brave, yeah. and you Kansas don't really of... want to be messing with them. I mean, I don't right. know why, how else, else I would formally... characterize them, to be honest. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Maybe I'm being optimistic or naive, but I, I, I find it hard to believe that a bunch of kids who really didn't sign up for this would be willing to, you know, root, like flatten a city of 4 million people who they were just told, like, are basically fellow Russians who are supposed to be part of your own country. 
But I mean, uh, the, maybe uh, these scenarios now are just so. You know, maybe. This is why. This is why for me the euphoria in the current moment has this this terrible feel to it because exactly. I mean, so one scenario is obliterating Syrian style urban warfare to the finish. And one would hope under those circumstances, an absolutely gigantic refugee wave to Western Europe. I mean, not millions, over 10 million, you would expect, right, to move West. Because what is there going to be like a rump Ukrainian state on the border to 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 Poland that's going to defend itself in some last ditch effort? I mean, so, or alternatively, the scenario that Matt, you used uh, you know, sketched out there, which is some sort of military mutiny, some, you know, comprehensive failure of the a strike, effectively a kind of Russian military strike. And, and that in a state with Russia's nuclear potential, we think, and given Putin's political characteristics is itself surely absolutely terrifying. I mean, this is, this is, um, not Belarus, one would imagine. Um, so it's, you know, are we going to see the Chenonman Square that, you know, Russia avoided in 89 or something even worse? Regime stability, what, what are the signals, signs, how, how, how do you, what, what's your sort of read on the, on the balance of internal power? I mean, who knows, but. I mean, the smart stuff I've read says, you know, we're in the third or fourth generation now. It's the hard men, the men of violence, the men of force, the security personnel that really dominate the scene. The oligarchs are, you know, are kept in their place. They get rich, they collaborate, they provide technical functions of various types, but they, the deal is they say nothing about grand strategy, nothing about broader politics. The fact that some of them have spoken out in various tentative ways is remarkable, but probably not all that consequential because they don't hold power. And it's the hardcore of the security apparatus that does. And, you know, watching for tremors within that requires a level of inside knowledge that I don't know. Certainly no one I'm able to read in real time in the West appears to have that kind of insight into those mechanisms, the Sechins and the, you know, the people are running the FSB and the Inter International Intelligence Agency. They're the people where the power seems to rely, to, 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 to lie ultimately. People were trying to read the facial expressions of the senior military commanders at that new kiddo, you know, display that Putin yeah. put on on Sunday morning. I mean, that's a the, pretty uh, poor information base. The um, uh, I mean, that national security, the Security Council meeting right. was really. Is there that, any that, analogy that came to mind for either of you? Because that, that was something. That what? I mean, the foreign intelligence chief. I mean. And I wouldn't normally feel sorry for like the head of Russian foreign intelligence, given like what we know they've been up to over the years. But like, I mean, honestly, the analogy I came up with, and I mean, maybe this is not fair, but like the way, you know, Mao used to humiliate people or the way Stalin used to humiliate people, quite frankly, like, yeah. you know, you have just the paramount leader just uh, asserting their total dominance in a meeting by just mocking them. Oh, we don't want to annex Luhansk. We're recognizing their independence. You know, do you not, did you not read the memo? I mean, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It does make you what I mean, that, that raises a lot of questions. I mean, presumably that guy doesn't feel good about his position, which creates interesting dynamics. On the other hand, the fact that Putin feels comfortable doing it also tells you about his state of mind and his view of his own position. It's very it's a, it's definitely been a very stressful week. And I mean, I you know, we're fortunate that we live very far away from any having like derail physical risk unlike a lot of other people who mm. are much closer to this, but it you know, it, it's been it's definitely the world of the, what I thought it was, you know, a week and a half ago is not the way it was. And that's been, um, very disorienting. Um, let's close with, uh, a, a, a book recommendation. I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what should people be reading now? That is it. Twitter. So, uh, Nick Mulder's, uh, economic warfare. Oh no! What's it called? No, not uh, Nick Mulder's. Uh, Nick Mulder's the economic weapon um, out with Yale, blockbuster new history on on uh, sanctions. Yeah, couldn't have timed that better. Uh, yeah, def um, hmm. well, actually, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna recommend. I mean, I've been I've been tweeting about this, but Ben Style a couple of years ago wrote a book called uh, "The Marshall Plan" in the beginning of the Cold War. 
which is about the 1940s, but kind of strikingly in terms of the links between economic integration in Europe and the way that the Soviet Union at the time perceived that as a security risk and how that led to the creation of NATO. Um, surprisingly relevant in thinking about, you know, the past few years and past week for that matter. So I'm going to recommend that. All right. Thanks for being part of China Talk.